how did we get to the point of where we are today such that we are a society now unable to look at a healthy newborn baby who is fully intact and not be able to tell ourselves whether the child is a girl or a boy? How is it that I, Sarah Sumner, can walk into a college classroom and encounter students who say they do not know whether I am a woman or a man? The answer to this question points to the title of my talk. It's all about who we say God is. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sarah Sumner, and I speak to you today in my capacity as a public theologian. I'm a systematician, not a politician. I have a PhD in systematic theology. I'm specially trained to grapple with abstractions and the seemingly impossible, very practical task of understanding and explaining how everything fits with everything, how this relates to that. Theology is the queen of the sciences. Therefore, in some sense, my job is to explicate the unity of reality, the unity of the cosmos, the unity of truth, and even so, how in the world did we get from talking about whether I'm a man or a woman and what that has to do with who we say God is? So this is all about unity. Uni unity pertains to wholeness, togetherness, cohesion, coherence, cogency. Real unity is an aspect of integrity. Now let's think of mathematically an integrity integer, a whole number, not a fraction. And now we go from wholeness to holiness. So you see, we've already come back to God. Many of us know that all the great universities were founded for the sake of seeking truth, for seeking God, for seeking the holiness of God, and seeking to understand the wholeness and the holiness, the holiness and the wholeness of the universe, the universe, the university, unity, unity. Theology has to do with the various subjects of all the university, starting with the starting point of God. And what I want to point out today is if we don't start with God, we're going to end up being so gullible that somebody could talk us into something that's completely different from what the evidence right in front of us tells us. So I hope you see now the connection between the question of how could anybody look at me and say they don't know if I'm a woman, well, that goes back to our starting point. Did we start with God or not? So you might have heard Yoram Hazoni. He's often saying, we've got to get the Bible back into the classroom. We have to get God into education. And I wholeheartedly agree with him because if we don't, we're going to end up being so gullible, we could believe anything. So I brought a chart for you. And I made this chart specially for people here at the National Conservatism Conference. So this is a chart. You can get it from the organizers. Let me try to put it straight. And you can see on here, it says starting point. It's the starting point chart. And what I'm pointing out over here in the left column is who God is. So now we can look at this and say, you know, anybody can say anything about who God is. So this whole thing is ridiculous. Somebody can say a rabbit's foot is God. Somebody else could say, you know, there are many gods and people can say anything they wanted. So how can we, how can we really make sense of this? So what I want to say to you again, I've already said it, but let's think this through. Theology has to do with all the various subjects of the university. Theology has to do with math. As a matter of fact, I would argue that you can't do math without the starting point of God. So I want to say this radical beginning, and, and here it is. I believe that God is God. And I believe that whether or not I believe it, God is God. So can we start with the very beginning to say, if there is a God, then God is God. And if God is, then however God is, is however God is. So God's godness is the very starting point in the way that God really is. The Old Testament puts it this way. God says, I am who I am. God is who God is. 
So the starting point being God, however God is, is however God is. Now, if however God is, is however God is, then reality is reality. The reality of how God is, is the reality of how God is, no matter what anybody says. God doesn't need us to believe that God exists for God to exist. God's godness does not depend on anything but God's godness. That's the that's that's the definition of God is God is God. So now somebody might say, well, I still am frustrated with you because you're just starting with this point and you didn't prove it. And you didn't give me all these reasons. And we're supposed to be talking about conservatism. And what I'm saying is this, let's conserve the idea of God as God, because if we don't, we're going to jettison our logic. We're going to jettison our education. We're going to jettison our society. We're going to jettison our civilization. We're going to, we're going to lose America. So I want to go slowly through this, but in a kind of fast way. So if you look at the chart, you're going to see here in the left corner, if we start with God, we can say, this is, it, it all boils down to who God is. A.W. Tozer says this, and, and I fully agree with him. Whatever comes into our minds when we talk about God is the most important thing about us. No nation has ever risen above its idea of God. So you look there on the left corner to go, okay, who God is. Now, God reveals who God is. God is who God says God is. God is who God is. That's revelation. So revelation there is, re is pointing to the revealer. Whatever God the revealer reveals about God's self is divine revelation. And I'm going to argue that all we have is what God has revealed. One of the things God has revealed is that God is God. Now, if God is God, that means Dr. Sarah Sumner is Dr. Sarah Sumner. It means Sarah is Sarah. It means that you are you. It means that zero is zero. See, because if we don't know that zero is zero, we can't trust math. We're not going to be able to do math in university and trust in the logic of math if we can't settle and conserve the idea that zero is zero. Bertrand Russell was a brilliant mathematician, and he famously wrote an essay called Why I Am Not a Christian. I read that when I was in high school, and I did this whole big search of thinking, you know what? Am I going to be a believer or not? Like, am I going to follow God or like, what am I going to do? So I set up this card table in my bedroom when I was about 16 years old. And I read all this different stuff. I read different religions. I read atheistic stuff. And I thought, I don't want to be a sucker. And now I'm writing you a chart that goes from the left side at the top of who God is now go to the right side of this column and look all the way down. And the last thing on there is the word gullibility, that you're going to be gullible. I didn't want to be gullible. And so I did homework for nine years from age 16 to 25. And by the end of my 25th year or my study when I was 25, I remember I had tears in my eyes and I had just finished reading G.K. Chesterton's wonderful book called Orthodoxy, which I highly recommend to everyone. And I just thought, you know what? I am not an atheist. I am, I'm a sinner. I need help. I need salvation, but I'm not an atheist. And I asked all my questions. And this is partly what the university is for, for people to ask their questions and do their quest. But listen, if you don't start with God, then you're not going to get God in the mix. And that's again why I agree that we got to get the Bible, we got to get, we got the whole question of God in the university front and center. It's the cornerstone of truth. And what now God is not an it. When I said it's the cornerstone, I'm saying having that starting point is the is is the cornerstone. So let's look at the chart. Who God is is at the top left. And then it goes down to Revelation. So God is God. If God is God, then however God is, is however God is, and that would be the revelation of God, that would be the reality. So if reality is reality, then truth is truth. And if truth is truth, then now we can say zero is zero. We can actually say A is A, which and that's the very basis of philosophy, right? It's not that A is B. We don't know what B is. B might be four, A might be three. So we can't say A equals B necessarily, but we can say A equals A. And we know the one thing that A is not is not A. 
A does not equal not A. God does not equal not God. God is God. If God is God, then however God is, is however God is. If however God is, is however God is, then reality is reality. If reality is reality, then truth is truth. And if truth is truth, then A is A, and zero is zero, and Sarah is Sarah. And a woman is a woman. And a tree is a tree. A person is a person. Apple is an apple. You see, now we're in the land of reality. And we could be like Helen Keller. You know, one of the most fascinating things I've ever read is Walker Percy's Lost in the Cosmos. I loved that book. I read that in my young years. And one of the things he talks about is like, you know, you're free falling through the cosmos, which most college students are. Like, how do we know what's what? And in that book, written by a Catholic, wonderful writer, and it's quirky, and somebody might think it's sacrilegious. It's coming, he comes at it from a crazy angle. But in that book, Lost in the Cosmos, Walker Percy speaks of Annie Sullivan, who helped Helen Keller. And see, lots of people had helped Helen Keller, who's blind and deaf and couldn't speak. She's dumb. Helen Keller was brilliant, but she would, she would be uncooperative. She was violent. She was messy. She would just stuff cake into her face. She couldn't eat, you know, because she didn't, she, she didn't know the concepts. She couldn't, she couldn't get the, she couldn't, she couldn't get her train of thought to go. And, and I'll explain to you why. See, other teachers could do like sign language and go, this is the cake. I mean, and, and she would go cake and she knew door. She knew cake. She knew run. She knew like this word, you know, but she, she was more like, it was more like training somebody like how much you would trade a parakeet or something. But Annie Sullivan broke through with her when she taught her the word is. So I could have slipped up when I already said, this is cake. It's not, she would, it would just be like cake, door. And then when Annie Sullivan's with her at the water faucet and that water gushes on and she's helping Helen, like getting her wet and going, this is water. And all of a sudden the lights went on and Helen Keller's like running around going, this is the cake. This is the door. This is the water. I get chills thinking about it right now. It makes me want to cry. The whole world opened up to her because she learned the word is. And I see what I've been saying to you here is God is is God. If God is God, then however God is, is however God is. And now we have this isness, this amness, this being. We know that something is, that it can be. And now we go, if we can see that I am a woman, when you do the math, when you do the logic, when you figure it all the way down, we get this reality. We can run around and we go, now I can bake a cake. I can build a boat. I can build a rocket. We can build a computer. We're dealing with reality because we started with God. People are wandering around, just blinker in the United States right now going, what in the world? How We're doing things that are insane. We're not following data. We're doing things that are anti-data. We're even saying that the science is the science when the science isn't the science. We're calling something science that isn't science. And now people are saying, how did we get away with this? How did this happen? And here's what I'm trying to say. It's because we didn't start with God. Now we can argue about God. Some people are going to say, well, let's, you know, we'll have this religion, that religion. Okay, so I'm not trying to take away from that. I'm just saying that we start with God. And I suggest we get this into the universities and into the public schools. And also that we get this into our politics. We've got to get into our public discourse. I say that to you, looking at this chart, and I invite you to go back with me to the chart. Let's go through it again. We're going slowly, but we're going to try to go fast. Okay, who God is is at the top left. Got it? And so now, however God is is however God is. That's a revelation. And because of that, now we've got reality revealed as reality, truth as truth, and now A as A, and zero as zero. So look, we've got who God is, revelation, truth, and now we get logic. Because if we say A is A, logically, we know then A is not, not A. Truth is not, not truth. Logic is not, not logic. Okay, now listen to this. So I was talking to a PhD student from Auburn University. And 
in my conversation with this student, the student who is getting a PhD at the time in psychology said this to me. The student said, oh, oh, see, you're logical and I'm illogical. And I said to the student, okay, wait, did you hear what you just said to me? You just said that I'm logical and that you're illogical. Do you think it's logical to be illogical or do you think it's illogical to be illogical? And the student said to me, Dr. Sumner, you're, 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 you're so intellectual. Wait, could you slow that down and say it again? So I did. And I said, do you think it's logical to be illogical? Or do you think it's illogical to be illogical? And the PhD student in a university that is so upstanding said, I think it's, I think it's logical to be illogical. The student says the student is an atheist. The student mocks things of God. See, the student is incapable of conserving the best of Western civilization, the best of society, the best of America, the best of what we know. And if we go all the way back into the best traditions in world history, because the student has not started with God, look what happened. And this is a person who's going to be a doctor. And this person now works in a major hospital as a psychologist. So now I'm going back to the chart. Slow is good. Slow is fast. Here we go. Who God is. And now we've got revelation. You see it on the chart. And because we have revelation, we'd say, how do we get from revelation to truth? Because we're saying, well, however God is, is however God is. And so that means that's the reality. So we're saying reality is reality and therefore truth is truth. And now we have logic as logic. I want to say one more thing. The big question, I believe, in the, in the cosmos is, okay, wait, who's the authority? How do we know? Like, who are you to say this? Well, let's start again with God. God is God. And if God is God, then God is the authority. And now we see in the, in the, the, in the scriptures, God is the creator. God is the author, the author, the authority, the authority. So now God has the authority to say who God is. As a matter of fact, Sarah has the authority to tell you who Sarah is. You don't know when I taste ice cream if I like the chocolate one or the vanilla one. You're going to have to find that revealed from me. I have the authority to tell you which one I like. And you don't have the authority to know because you don't have access to that. And I have that revealing power. Now we're going to see on the chart because I'm made in the image of God. And so are you. So we have who God is. Now we have revelation. Now we got the truth. Now we got logic. And now we have the theo, theos logic, theology. It's theology is the study of the revelation of God. And a lot of people say, no, theology is the study of God. And we don't want to study God in the university because then we'll all just know about God and we won't be able to build a rocket or a computer. Hold it. Theology is not the study of God. If God is God, and God is godness, God is, God is supernatural, and we're natural. How is natural ever going to get it supernatural? I mean, how is Hamlet ever going to study Shakespeare? Okay, so we've got to keep God as God. If God is God, then God is God, and God is that authority, and God is the revealer, and so all we have is what God has revealed, and in Deuteronomy 29, 29, we find out God didn't reveal all of God's self. As a matter of fact, if God is infinite and we're finite, God can't reveal all of God's self to finite because that doesn't work mathematically. If we try to fit God into our head, if we try to go, well, I'm really smart and I'm going to fit God into my head so I can study God, guess what? Your head's going to split. You cannot fit infinite into the finite. It won't work. And that's why people who try to do the science and the math to figure out God and go, let me prove it. You prove it to me. Then I'll believe in God. That's not how it starts. That's not how it works. That doesn't even make sense. That's illogical. So let's go back to the chart. That us logic. That's the queen of the sciences. And now we say, oh, zero is zero. And now we can do math. And, and now we see that there's a creator, God, and we've got creation. And now we have purpose because God made the design. The, design, the creator is logical. If we're the creation and here we are as creatures, and we're logical, it doesn't make sense that God would be unable to do logic if I can do logic. 
Because if God is God, God's got to be superior to me. I'm not God. I can't read your mind. I wasn't here in 2000. I, I wasn't here in, in 19, I mean, 1888. I'm just randomly throwing out a number. I mean, you get the point. I wasn't here. None of y'all think I was, I'm God, right? But then sometimes we get confused <laughs> and we bow to other people as God. And we bow to other authorities as God. And that's how we get messed up. So now if you can look on the chart, humans are made in the image of God. Now we have human dignity. And that's why we say, wait a second, we're not going to abort the babies. Because that little baby, you know, it's not just tissue that's right there in, in, that, in that woman's womb. The only way any of us were ever born, that's the dignity of being, you know, five minutes old. The dignity of being five months old. The dignity of being five years old, five decades old. Human dignity. So now let's look right and almost in the middle of the chart on the left side, the scientist. A scientist of divine revelation, that's what a theologian is. That's what I am, okay? I'm a trained theologian. I'm trained to look at the revelation of God as revelation and go, God revealed that zero is zero. And he made me in his image so I can think. And you can think. If you understand this talk, it's kind of proven you're made in the image of God who thinks. And that we can connect here because we're all humans. And we have the dignity to have a conversation. But now if we're going to be dishonest, we're not going to have a logical conversation because truth and logic are flip sides of one coin. And so, see, when we have a crisis of truth in our country, we now live in a lying culture. We also live in an illogical culture that's producing PhD students, graduates, who don't see the value of logic because they weren't taught the, the, the basis of truth, like how we were supposed to be doing it all of our universities, have it be a quest for truth. Now, it doesn't mean that we're going to be indoctrinating people. Some people might go, hold it, hold it. I don't like this. We're not talking about indoctrinating people where they don't think. We're talking about thinking with people so they can think and we can think together. So we can invite the students to set up a card table in their bedroom from age 16 to 25 and go, let's ask the hard questions. How do you know? How do you know? What makes you say that? What's the evidence? What's the logic behind it? Is it coherent? Is that cogent? Does it line up with what you see? Come on, let's be honest. And that's what we're talking about here. So when we get honest, we go, yeah, it really doesn't make sense to try to say we can be honest without God. Because otherwise, we wouldn't even know if truth is truth. So now if you look on your chart again, you know, and we're saying a theologian is somebody who is studying that, that, that divine revelation, which means theology is giving birth to math that zero is zero, and now we can do differential equations and fancy calculus and this and that. We've, it's given birth to philosophy, A equals A, A does not equal not A, and now we can have a philosophy of science, we can run our experiments, we can say we're made in the image of God, I can trust this reality, we're all at the Helen Keller level, this is the water, this is the tree, and now we can build things, we can do prevention, we can do forensics, we have all kinds of things opened up to us. Because we see there's objective truth. Now, now listen, I know about postmodernity. People say, no, there's nothing objective. Well, hold it. God is. God is God. And when we start there, we say, wait, that is objectively true. But now we need to add something to that. And that is that you have to have a knower in order to have knowledge. So I, being someone created in the image of God, I can know. And so I subjectively know because I'm a subject. I'm like, oh, I subjectively know that objective truth. Oh, there's a whole lot more to talk about on that. Epistemology, that's a subject everybody needs to study, including lawyers, including judges, including politicians, and including kindergarten teachers. So we can teach little kids, wait, how do we know that? So now we've got all disciplines are submitted to truth. And now we can have a university, the university where everything's connected, and we go, let's think theologically. See, to think theologically in the proper way, you're thinking mathematically, scientifically, artistically, musically. You're thinking in terms of all the different disciplines, and all the disciplines are submitted to truth, and we know that truth is truth because we know that God is God. So now we can have a paideia approach to university, which means we're going to do character formation. We're going to like help someone actually be truthful so they can actually do their doctoring. They can be an honest physician who tells you the honest, you know, diagnosis. 
And the same thing with all the rest of the professions. So Paideia, you see this on the chart, a little bit low, but halfway down, um, a little bit below halfway. Okay, so a Paideia model is where Dr. Sumner is teaching this student. I'm going to call the student Bob. We'll say we have Bob and let's say we have Maria. So Dr. Sumner is teaching Maria the subject. Dr. Sumner is teaching Bob. Now look over across. We haven't gone over, but let's look over across the chart and see this Wissenschaft model. See, a Wissenschaft model means that Dr. Sumner is teaching the subject. It doesn't matter who the student is. I'm not teaching Maria. I'm not teaching Bob. I might even be having an affair with one of them. Who they are doesn't matter. Who I am doesn't matter in a Wissenschaft model. All that matters is the research. Let's just, let's just make way fast progress and do real research, but let's discount the imago dei, the image of God, the humanity, the dignity of the person. Let's certainly don't fear the Lord. We're doing Wissenschaft. And see, when you do Wissenschaft and you're also fancy smart in all your science, you just go down that chart and you're headed straight toward gullibility. So let's go back to the left side. And you see all, all disciplines are submitted to truth. Now you've got a university, you've got a paideia approach. Now you have moral formation. And we have students coming to college, going to grad school, going into specialty in their field of PhD or medicine or whatever it is, and learning to have moral formation. They themselves are becoming truthful people who can argue without quarreling. See, we're losing academic freedom because we don't have the moral formation to argue without quarreling. Arguing is a great way to find truth. We need to have people start with God so we can have a whole bunch of arguments and then find more truth, more truth, more truth, and actually get bonded together in those arguments if we honestly have a quest for truth as opposed to separating from each other. Now, let's keep looking. And you go down it and you've got moral formation. Now you can have human development, actually developing the person. You know, liberal arts is supposed to be about the question, what is a human? And have human development. Look across the, the chart and see professional development. Now, professional development, that counts. But that's going to be also focused on money. You know, we don't even care who you are. We don't even need an ethics course. You know, when the housing debacle happened in America in 2008, I mean, from what I understand, they went, oh, yeah, this came out of Harvard MBA school. I'm like, oh, yeah, maybe we better have an ethics course for people because we can do a whole lot of fancy math and figure out, wow, we're going to make all this money. We can avoid the debt. Hey, we can eliminate risk. You know, that's illogical. It is illogical to say we can make macro decisions and eliminate risk. That does not make sense at all. Now, how do you get really smart people to buy into that and fool themselves, deceive themselves, be so gullible? that they think they can actually avoid risk and do all this fancy work. It's because we didn't start with God. If you have human development, you can actually have a student. Look across the chart. Do you want to be a student or do you want to be a customer? See, I had a student come up to me one day and I used to be a professor um, in university. And now I'm, I'm the president of Right on Mission, which is a different kind of entity, kind of a forerunner for a new way of doing Christian higher education. You can find it at rightonmission.org. And at Right on Mission, we have students. When I was in university, I had a student who thought he was a customer. And he was upset with me because, he, doggone it, he purchased that A. He was a customer. He came to the class. He wanted to purchase his A. And now we have enormous pressure on professors to have a halo effect in their grading. And so what we have is academic crisis at the faculty level because You've got the registrars who also have all this pressure. The thing is driven by money. We have such a corporate push, a corporate thrust, a corporate riptide that's taking away the integrity of our universities. And we're graduating people who really don't even know what they're talking about. And then we end up hiring people who might not even know what they're talking about. Okay, let's look at the chart. If we have students and we can study humanities, you know, a, a lot of this postmodern stuff, it came out of the humanities. Well, that's because we, we forgot about God. We didn't start with God. Humanities are good. You know, all these, all the subjects 
in the university, they all have a certain viability. We can have methodology in each one with God as a starting point, but we forgot that. Some of the disciplines might think, no, we can't start with God or we can't even have our discipline. And so, well, you know what? You're going to end up being gullible. You're going to end up cheating on the grading because you don't have that bedrock cornerstone to stop you from falling into that over time. Let's look at this. If we've got humanities, now we can actually talk about sex. And when I say sex, I mean like a male versus a female. We can talk about the actual sex. If we look on the right side, we're going to talk about gender and go, oh, well, this is just a way that a person's got a biological body and that doesn't really tell us anything truthful. We don't really need that. If we, if, we can, if we can be honest, we can say, let's look at the sex because you don't want to have even the same laws for a woman as a man. And I could get into that a little more. Let me give you one example. You know, if you're going to have a wrestling match at, and, and a fatal murderous wrestling match between a man and a woman, most of the time the man is going to win, right? And so when, when a woman, if she's going to plot to murder somebody, a man, she's probably going to have to do it in a different kind of way than he would do. And now if you have a law that doesn't take account her physical, relatively speaking, vulnerability, he's vulnerable, but she's different vulnerable because she has an opening that he doesn't have to his body. So men are vulnerable and women are more vulnerable physically in the sense of having that opening, a house and her body that he doesn't have that house inside his body. And I tell parents, that's why your boys throw themselves around in a way girls don't. Girls just sort of intuitively know, I guess I have a house in there, in the lower part of my, of my body. So if we're not going to take into account sex, this is going to have impact in the law. Of course, it'll have impact in medicine and cholesterol levels. You know, we've got to be honest about who we are if we're going to have logic and we're going to have peace and stability and flourish together as society. Now let's look at the next one. Human race. We're all humans. Can we look and say, oh, I'm human. I have lighter skin. You have darker skin. Now I know there's been a whole lot of, of, of terrible misbehavior, atrocities that have happened when people get confused and they think they're superior because this one's got, you know, this kind of body and this one's got that kind of body, this kind of skin and that color of skin. But what I'm saying is that if we start with God, we can get back to the thing of saying, okay, we, we have a human race. You know, a lot of people don't know that Abraham in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, think about Abraham, the Muslim, the, the Jewish, and the Christian traditions all go back to Abraham. Did you know that Abraham married a woman named Keturah who was black? I, wish, I always wish everybody would know that St. Augustine, if we're going to have like a contest of who's the greatest theologian outside of scripture, probably St. Augustine would win. Was he black? You know, he's African. And so we can say, look, let's all be humans and don't commit the sin of partiality. We don't want to be partial to the rich. We don't want to be partial to people of this skin, not that skin. We're humans. And the only way we're going to be, work, be able to work this out politically is for us to start with God. So now we can do human race. And now we've got responsible knowers. I've already talked to you about that. I can be a knower. And I see that I'm human and I don't say, oh, well, this person has different color skin. So they're not a responsible knower. And that's happened. You know, and you can, you can read books about this where people think, oh, if you have dark skin, you're not a responsible knower. That is a lie. So now we go to the next one and say, well, now we can have knowledge. If you have a responsible knower, a knower has knowledge. And now we can actually do facts. Let's look across the chart instead of just doing feelings. Okay, and now look at the bottom of the left, and now we can actually do discernment because we can say, well, let's discern. Let's go from the bottom of the left chart all the way up. You can go from discerning. Let's discern the facts. Let's get some knowledge. We'll be responsible knowers. We're all humans here. Yes, we've got male and female and the sex, and we have people have different experiences. We can listen to it all. We can look at the humanities and look at different cultures, different times. We can do anthropology. We can do all kinds of stuff because we're students. 
who actually are getting developed as humans and with moral formation so that we're honest in our studies. We're doing a Paideia model in the university, all disciplines submitted to truth so that we can be subjectively knowing the objective truth. We can be scientists of divine revelation, which would make us all some kind of a theologian with a human dignity, seeing that we're made in the image of God and we have purpose and there's design and there's creation so that now theology is the queen of the sciences. Did you know there's no theology department at Harvard University? And now we can be logical and truthful and do the revelation of God because God is God. That could change everything for Auburn University. Look at the, look at the right side. How did we fall off this wagon? I'm going to go through this much more quickly than I did the left side. How did we fall off this wagon? Because we stopped talking about who God is. And now we're saying, well, what's Christianity? And we took a sociological approach and went, oh, well, they're just saying this, they're saying that. And now we're doing religion and now we're doing politics and going, look, this whole thing's all about power. And now all the things that Nietzsche says start to make sense because we had the wrong starting point. To talk about what Christianity is, is the wrong starting point. Even to talk about what America is, is the wrong starting point. And it's going to lead us down to the bottom of the chart. Look at this. If you're just going to do what the religion is, now you're going to end up doing power, not truth. And you're going to do politics. And we're going to do, you know, we're going to be taught to be polite, political, political, instead of honest. And so now we're doing all this cancel culture. And you have to know what to say. And we're doing political correctness. That starts at the very top of that right hand side of the chart. And we're doing sophistry. And that just, you know, sound good and just fool people and all this persuasive stuff and scientism, not science. And now we're saying, you know, there, there's no God. There's no author. There's no creator. We're just doing evolution. Everybody just kind of came out of the miry soup. And it's just a fascinating process. And yes, we've found discoveries because we were looking at the actual evidence. But we don't need that philosophy of science to just kick God out. Because when we did that, now we said things are random chance. Now we're saying we're not really humans, we're just animals. Maybe we should be able to marry our dog. Maybe we're just a machine. We can just kind of mix ourselves up with robots. Now we're doing cultural respectability instead of human dignity, if you look to the left. And now we're doing social scientists and we're really basically turning ourselves into bureaucrats as opposed to looking at the revelation of what we really have and kind of Helen Kellering it. <laughs> if I can say it that way, you know, and now instead of saying, wait a second, I'm a subjective knower, being a responsible knower who can actually have knowledge. Now we're doing subjective ism and saying everything's about perceptions. That gets really crazy in court. And you don't want that to happen to you when you're the one who somebody stole your bicycle. We're having autonomous disciplines, a multiversity, not a university with that Wissenschaft approach, which I already explained. And now instead of having moral formation, we're doing all moral research and going, it doesn't matter if you can do it, you can do it. Who cares about ethics? And now we're doing professional development. You know what? Let's just kick out all those liberal arts. All we need is a university that helps you get a job and make money. And now we've got customers and we're doing cultural, we're going to cultural relativism. You know, instead of the humanities, it's all just boiled down to like, what do you think? What do you think? It's all getting splintered. And it's unanchored to truth because it's not grounded in God. And we've lost our is. And so now we're not saying she is a woman. This is a boy. And now we've lost it. And now we're doing with the gender. And now people are saying, wait, how did we get all this with CRT? You know, when I see things like this, you know, the radical feminist movement or CRT, they're complaining about something that's a real sin. There are real sins under there. And we need to listen and go, wait, what are you talking about? Because there's clamoring and anguish and grief. And if we'll start with who God is, we can listen. And we can all adjust together with as a human race unto truth and logic. And see, so, you know, have you noticed the chart doesn't have love on it? Where are we going to get love? How are we going to get love without God? You know, you don't get love out of evolution. You don't get love out of autonomous disciplines. You don't get love out of cultural relativism. 
And so now let's look at this. On the fourth from the bottom on the right side, instead of having responsible knowers, we're going to get schooled agnostics. As a matter of fact, if you graduate from university and you think you know something, you might flunk out of school because the epistemology right now in universities is saying this. You don't know anything. And you have to prove you're an agnostic. Now that gets really crazy because if you can't know something, of course you're going to be gullible. You don't know anything. Instead of doing knowledge, we're doing propaganda. Boy, does that hit the politics. That hits the newspaper. That hits the media. That hits the social media. And then we're doing feelings. And last thing you know is we're gullible. And so I am here to say to you, what we've got to conserve is starting with God. It all goes back to who we say God is. Are we going to start with God or not? If we start with America, we're going to lose America. If we start with anything but God, we're doomed. And we're going to just self-implode. But if we start with God, then we can rebuild. And I vote let's do just that. God bless you. Thank you.